Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Iran opposition leaders call for election anniversary rallies. Tonight I can report that Obama talks to Muslim entrepreneurs and the Battle of the Burqa continues in France. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. Iranian opposition leaders Mir Hussein Musawi and Mehdi Karoubi called on their supporters to demonstrate on June 12, which marks the first anniversary of the re-election of President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. A website run by the opposition quoted Karoubi and Musawi calling on all reformist groups and parties to submit requests to the Ministry of Interior for permission to demonstrate on the occasion. Sahem News, a website run by the opposition, said that this time the meeting between the two opposition leaders, Mir Hussein Musawi and Mehdi Karoubi, ended with a call on their supporters to demonstrate on the occasion of the upcoming first anniversary of President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's re-election on June 12. According to the website, the two leaders urged the organization of this gathering and called on all parties and groups described as reformists to send requests to the Iranian Ministry of Interior for permission to organize these demonstrations. It is worth mentioning that this call comes nearly two months after the demonstration is to take place, showing that the opposition intends to prepare well for the upcoming protests. It also comes one month after what some have described as a period of relative silence from the Iranian opposition leaders. Yesterday, Mir Hussein Musawi broke his silence and accused the government of rigging the last elections and of pressuring the opposition in the name of Islam. Musawi said that the country is facing a crisis and that the only way for Iran to get out of it is to change the rulers of the country. He also stated that what he called the reform movement still exists. The call from the two opposition leaders comes at a time when the Iranian military is incessantly exhibiting its strength in the face of those who are thinking about attacking it. Iran aims to prove that it will not give up its rights to nuclear technology despite all the pressure from the West and the threats to impose serious sanctions on Ahmadinejad's authority. The call for a protest also comes at a time when discussions are increasing within Iran's governance about the so-called Green Revolution's failure in achieving its goals and changing the regime. Remaining in the United States, a media rights group has urged the Pentagon to investigate the deaths of journalists at the hands of American troops in Iraq. Now, the Committee to Protect Journalists say a total of 16 journalists and three assistants have been killed by U.S. troops in Iraq. Now, among the dead are reporters with Reuters news agencies. They were killed in 2007 in an airstrike incident broadcasted by whistleblower website WikiLeaks. Earlier this month, the New York-based committee published a list of a dozen countries where journalists have been killed. Iraq tops the list with 88 unsolved journalist murders. Well, Amnesty International has accused several European countries of violating the U.N. rules by forcing Iraqi refugees to return to their country. Now, the U.S.-based rights group criticized Denmark, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and the U.K. for forcibly sending back Iraqi refugees to unsafe parts of the war-torn country. Amnesty says such moves violate the guidelines of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. UN estimates that some 5 million Iraqis have been displaced since the 2003 U.S.-led invasion of Iraq. Well, a NATO soldier has been killed in eastern Afghanistan. Now, the Western Alliance says the soldier was killed in a gun attack. The nationality of the soldier has not been revealed. This brings to 170 the number of foreign troops to die in Afghanistan this year. Now, NATO and the United States are deploying thousands of extra troops to Afghanistan. They're expected to peak at 150,000 later this year. 
Well, a diplomat from the Indian Embassy in Pakistan has been arrested in New Delhi. This on charges of spying for Islamabad. Second Secretary Madhuri Gopta is suspected of handing over classified documents to the Pakistani Inter-Services Intelligence, or ISI. Her movements were detected by India's Intelligence Bureau. Gopta had worked at the mission in Islamabad for three years. Now authorities had summoned her back to India on the pretext of discussions. She was arrested after returning home. New Delhi has often accused the ISI of aiding militant groups that carry out attacks in India. Islamabad has repeatedly denied the charges. U.S. President Barack Obama announced four American initiatives to support and develop investment and entrepreneurship in the Muslim world. He said that the efforts exerted by his administration to deliver the promise that he made during his speech in Cairo have resulted in special funds that will provide wide-ranging opportunities for American-Muslim partnerships in the fields of investment, health, education, and technology. Here, inside the halls of the Reagan International Trade Center, the Obama administration met with people representing 50 Muslim countries who came with initiatives and investment ideas during a two-day summit for the development of investment and entrepreneurship in Muslim countries. Obama, who promised to hold this summit during his speech in Cairo, came with a means that he believes will contribute in developing and innovating these initiatives and investments. And tonight, I can report that the Global Technology and Innovation Fund that I announced in Cairo will potentially mobilize more than $2 billion in investments. This is private capital, and it will unlock new opportunities for people across our countries in sectors like telecommunications, healthcare, education, and infrastructure. Obama also approved four proposed joint programs in which investors and entrepreneurs from Muslim countries and the U.S will exchange business trips. In addition, the U.S. will provide laboratory training for female technology researchers from various Muslim countries, send a number of science professors to Muslim countries to help develop their scientific research capabilities, and send experts from the U.S. technology centers in Silicon Valley to exchange their expertise with their colleagues in the Middle East, Turkey, and Southeast Asia. The conference showcased some examples of success. Ba'ad Tawil, a Palestinian female college student, started an initiative to organize and plan weddings in Ramallah with a budget of less than $800. She said that the idea expanded and needs support from a conference like this one. Attending a summit like this broadened my horizon, and it will change my future and grant me an amazing opportunity. Just like this occasion, of course, we can network with other Muslim entrepreneurs. Malia Madili, Lamis al Mufti, Munal Mer, and Nur al Maghrabi came from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia with their initiatives. All use the infamous slogan carried by President Obama during his electoral campaign, which is change. You need to produce the change in your society. The change that we want in the society is social change, in which there is an investment in the youth. These girls know that the organizers of this conference aim to create a good image of the United States. In order to show the significance of the location, President Obama announced that the next summit will be held in one of the most prominent Muslim countries, Turkey. He said that the U.S. will continue to participate in the organization and the planning of future summits as long as he is in office. However, the maintenance and the outcome of these summits remains unclear. Former U.S. President George Bush hosted a similar conference called the U.S. Arab Economic Forum that only lasted three years without producing any significant results. Nukban Ahmed, BBC, from inside the Reagan Building in the U.S. Capitol, Washington.
أحييكم أعلن رئيس قائمة العالم. The head of the Iraqi bloc and former prime minister Iyad Alawi announced that his bloc will appeal the justice and accountability panel decision to disqualify 52 candidates and invalidate the votes they received, so that the decision will have no bearing on the election results. During a visit to Turkey, Alawi said that he intends to ask the UN to intervene in order to save what he referred to as the politicized political process in Iraq. We are going to call on the United Nations to bear its responsibility because Iraq is still under the mandate of Chapter 7 of the Security Council. We need the UN to intervene to salvage the political process because it has been politicized and the counting and recounting has been politicized. We have heard that tomorrow another list of candidates will be disqualified based on groundless accusations. Some candidates are from the Communist Party, but they absolutely have no links to the Ba'ath Party. Meanwhile, Iraqi Vice President and Iraqi leader Tariq al-Hashimi said that his blog believes that the decision of the Justice and Accountability Panel infringes on the right of the Iraqi bloc to form the new government by attempting to change the election results. If this decision is not appealed, the Iraqi bloc will consider it to be an attempt to change the results of the elections, which is an infringement on the constitutional and legal rights of the Iraqi bloc to form the government. The Iraqi bloc won this right because it won the largest numbers of votes in the elections, which entitles it to form the new government. In light of the recent developments, al Iraqi will view the change in the results of the elections as a dangerous development. This is assuming that the Justice and Accountability Panel will make such a decision. I hope that such a decision will not be made. If it is, then we will consider it to be a dangerous development. Convicted of two disciplinary offenses, former commander of the IDF's Galilee Division, Brigadier General Imad Faris, got off with light punishment, a warning and a reprimand. Deputy Chief of Staff Benny Gantz issued the ruling and Chief of Staff Gabi Ashkenazi said he will decide on Faris's future in the Army in the coming days. Faris's problems arose from allowing his wife to drive his military issue car and failure to report a minor accident she incurred while driving that vehicle. Disgraceful, that's the word used by an Israeli official in describing the Gilad Shalit animated propaganda film made public by Hamas yesterday. The cartoon was released on the 1,400th day of Shalit's captivity. More in this report. The 3D, three-minute animated film released by Hamas over the weekend depicts Noam Shalit wandering the streets of Israel, holding a picture of his captured son Gilad. Gilad's voice can be heard in the background, the same words we once heard from the videotape of him previously released by Hamas. As Noam Shalit walks through the empty streets, he passes billboards with photographs of former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, which symbolize the passage of time. Noam becomes old, his hair turns gray, and he's shown walking with a cane as text appears on the screen saying, finally, the Israeli government's efforts succeed. After exchanging prisoners, Noam Shalit finally meets up with his son Gilad, at which point a car pulls up and a coffin with an Israeli flag draped over it is taken out. No, Noam screams as he wakes up from the nightmare he's just had and realizes it was all a dream. The video ends with the text, There is still hope, which is Hamas's cynical way of urging the Israeli public to put a prisoner exchange at the top of the nation's agenda. Israeli officials who saw the cartoon criticized it, calling it another campaign of psychological warfare unleashed by Hamas. For months now, Hamas has refused to respond to the humanitarian proposals of the German, German mediator and has allowed this situation to drag on. Today, with the release of this disgraceful video designed to play on the pain of the Shalit family, Hamas is demonstrating its terrorist and cruel character. Noam Shalit had his own response to the video, saying that Hamas would do better to concern itself with the true interests of the Palestinian prisoners and citizens of Gaza who have become hostages of their leaders instead of putting on films and displays. Although the video is a difficult one to watch, it struck a chord with all Israelis longing for a safe return home for Gilad Shalit. For IBA News, Farah Cardelli.
Hamas political bureau chief Khaled Mishal requested the end of Palestinian division and the agreement on a unified national agenda in order to face the Zionist attacks on Palestinian holy sites. Mishal made this statement during his participation over the phone in the sixth ceremony to mark the assassination of Dr. Abdel Aziz Rantisi in Gaza City. Let them bomb our cars and our homes. Let them kill us. But we promise God and we promise you that we will march forward in our path until we liberate our country. He was a man who carried both a gun and a pen. No one can forget Dr. Abdel Aziz Rantisi, the Lion of Palestine. He was a man who lived and died for his religion and country. The patriots loved him, the masters of literature loved him, and armed people loved him. Like the mountains in Khalil and Haifa, like the dome of the Aqsa Mosque, like the roots of the olive trees in Nablus and Al Jalil, his memory is deeply rooted in the hearts of the people. Why does it remain in existence while the blood of the sons of Hamas is being shed? His words and expressions used to and still reaffirm that victory is certain and that step by step it is being achieved. Rantisi was born in 1947 in the village of Yibna. His family immigrated to Gaza when he was six months old and settled in the Han Yunus refugee camp. At the age of six, he enrolled in a school founded by the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees. At the same time, he started working to help support his large family that was going through some difficulties. In 1972, Rantisi graduated from the medical department of Alexandria University in Egypt and then gained a master's degree in pediatrics. He was detained several times by the Israeli occupation for his participation in the resistance and for the establishment of the Islamic resistance movement, Hamas, in which he was one of the most prominent leaders. After the occupation failed to break his will, and after he became more and more determined with each arrest, the occupation forces deported him in 1992, along with hundreds of Mujahideen to Marj al-Zuhur in southern Lebanon. From there, he began to shine in the media as a prominent leader. He was also arrested several times by the security institutions of the former Palestinian Authority and was subjected to the cruelest kinds of torture in an attempt to break his and Hamas's will. With each release, he challenged the authority and demanded his rights. On June 10, 2003, the Lion of Palestine survived an assassination attempt that was carried out by Zionist helicopters. A companion of Rantisi and a number of passers-by, including a child, were martyred. On March 24, 2004, two days after Imam Sheikh Ahmad Yassin was assassinated, Dr. Rantisi was elected to succeed Yassin and became the leader of Hamas. On April 17, 2004, the Lion of Palestine met his fate. He was martyred, along with two of his companions, when a Zionist Apache aircraft shelled his car. The bombing ended the life of a man who devoted his life to his religion and to his country. Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir vowed to conduct a referendum for self-determination in South Sudan as scheduled on January 2011, as soon as his victory in the elections is announced. Meanwhile, al-Bashir will visit Cairo to meet with his Egyptian counterpart, Hosni Mubarak. This will be al-Bashir's first visit after his re-election, and will come after the two prominent opposition leaders, Sadiq al-Mahdi, the leader of the Ummah Party, and Mohammed Osman Mirgani, the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, visited Cairo a few days ago. As soon as the election results were announced, supporters of President al-Bashir and Salva Kiir, the president of the government of southern Sudan, took to the streets in Khartoum and Juba to celebrate the re-elections. <laughs> Throughout Khartoum, a great deal of joy can be witnessed in the celebrations for the re-election of Sudanese President al-Bashir for a second presidential term. I want to congratulate all the Sudanese people for the victory of Omar al-Bashir. I want to congratulate the Sudanese people. Al-Bashir's success is good because he stands for development and peace.
Supporters of al-Bashir expressed their joy by singing and dancing. They said that al-Bashir's victory is a response to all the accusations that were made against the Sudanese government at the local and international levels. I believe that the victory of the National Congress Party and the Sudanese president in particular to be a political victory at the international level and a vindication of the accusations that were leveled against him. The Sudanese government managed to prove its worthiness and show the international community that it is innocent. After the results of the elections were announced, al-Bashir said that he thanked God for this day and added that this victory is not only a victory for the National Congress Party but for all the Sudanese. Meanwhile, the supporters of Silva Kiir, the president of the government of southern Sudan, took to the streets to express their joy that he will maintain his post. Kiir congratulated al-Bashir for his victory in the elections. Let me congratulate President Omar al-Bashir. Let me congratulate Omar al-Bashir as the elected president of Sudan. I thank him for his decision to impose taxes on the election campaigns, and I thank him for fulfilling his election promises. The elections were held on the date that we agreed upon. After al-Bashir's victory, will he be able to defy the West and the International Criminal Court, which issued an international warrant for his arrest? The answers to these questions will become more clear in the coming days. Ahmad Fouad, Al Arabiya. Al -Arabiya. Five years have passed since the withdrawal of the Syrian army from Lebanon in the aftermath of the Cedar Revolution. Five years of hostilities between Syria and Lebanon have ended, marking the beginning of a new chapter in the institutional relations between the two countries. However, many challenges still impede the two countries' relations. Depending on whom you ask, this year, April 26, has a different meaning. Despite the major challenges straining the relations between Syria and Lebanon, the two countries have started to move toward diplomatic rapprochement. Over the past five years, many developments have impacted the Syrian-Lebanese relations. April 26, 2005 was a turning point in the relations between Syria and Lebanon. Over the past few months, Syria and Lebanon have maintained diplomatic ties via government institutions. A delegation of Lebanese general directors visited Damascus to review agreements signed between the two countries. The Syrian-Lebanese relationship is moving forward. As you have said, both nations have a credible and sincere willpower to improve their relations. God willing, the two countries will open a new chapter in their relations. This year, the fifth anniversary of the Syrian withdrawal from Lebanon, comes at a time when the two countries' relations started to witness a notable improvement. After years of hostilities and alienation, the new diplomatic efforts aim to rebuild trust between the two countries. The most tangible achievement was the opening of the embassies. In other words, we were able to close a case that was more than 60 years old. Historically, Syria has refused to establish diplomatic ties ties with Lebanon. The celebration of the French disengagement from Syria, which was held by the Syrian embassy in Beirut, is more proof of the normalization of relations between the two countries. This is what we need the most, especially at this critical time. Without a doubt, there's an opportunity to maintain a healthy institutional relationship between Syria and Lebanon. And this is exactly what both countries are doing. The visit of Lebanese Prime Minister Saad Hariri to Damascus was a turning point in the relations between the two countries. Despite the recent diplomatic efforts, the Syrian-Lebanese relations are still facing mounting challenges. The new rapprochement between Syria and Lebanon was evident in the ceremonial reception held at the Syrian embassy in Beirut, marking the French disengagement from Syria. This is the first such event to be attended by political blocs from both countries. Among the participants was the March 14th alliance, which reiterated its commitment to stronger ties with Syria. The opening of the embassies was among the most notable achievements in the past few years. However, many stalled issues and challenges still impede the Syrian-Lebanese relations. But Lebanese Prime Minister Saad Hariri is planning a second visit to Damascus, where a long list of pending issues awaits him. One can conclude that maintaining strong relations between Syria and Lebanon serves the common interests of both nations.
In France, demonstrations are expected to be held today in protest of the government's decision to submit a draft bill to the parliament that would ban wearing the niqab. However, despite having reassured a delegation from the French Council of Muslims during an emergency meeting held yesterday with Prime Minister Francois Fillon, the government is going forward with the bill. Mohamed Wamusi reports from Paris. Usually when French Muslims want to deal with the government, they are in no rush. This time, however, the situation was unbearable. A delegation representing the French Council of Muslims went to the headquarters of the French government to convey the anger of French Muslims over the niqab ban draft bill. Talks are ongoing between the Prime Minister and the French Council of Muslims, as well as other religious and civic organizations. The French Council of Muslims delegation met the Prime Minister only to talk about this issue and express the concerns of Muslims. Despite the assurances that the delegation received from the French government, the police fined a Muslim woman for driving while wearing the niqab under the pretext that she was driving while wearing uncomfortable clothes. In any case, the government's decision to propose a ban on the niqab has fueled the ongoing controversy over the issue. This is discrimination. They have no right to do this. When they fined me, they told me that I was driving while wearing uncomfortable clothes. I asked them to be more specific and write down that I was fined for wearing the niqab, but they refused. The government's response was swift. The interior minister announced that the woman's husband, who has 12 children, will be stripped of his French citizenship and expelled to his native country of Algeria for being a member of the so-called Islamic Dawa party and for being married to four women at the same time. The actions of the French interior minister are provocative. His actions show a lack of respect for French traditions. In fact, he's going against these traditions by taking such measures. Although the number of women wearing the niqab in France does not exceed 300, this story took center stage in French media, not to mention that local French channels have allocated an extended period of time for the coverage of the story. Many believe that this inflated coverage will only add fuel to the fire and increase tension in an already charged environment. Even before getting approval in Parliament, the law that would ban the niqab is already being implemented in France and started by fining a French woman for wearing the niqab and threatening to withdraw her husband's citizenship. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible from support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online, stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.